Hey everyone, so we're here to continue our study of Judaism by honing in and focusing on, I think, such a fascinating and pivotal character. And that is, of course, the great prophet Abraham, who is the key figure in the second half of the book of Genesis. Really, it's all about him, his wife Sarah, their son Isaac, and so on. So I just want to focus on a couple of stories that things that happen to Abraham and things that he does that I think really shape the values of Judaism. They telegraph for us what our, what our mitzvah is, what our holy work is, what our moral obligation is. Abraham is one of those paradigmatic figures that models for us what our human obligation is and the maintenance of the covenant between us and God, but he's a, a paradoxical figure. It's not simple. You'll see what I mean. So we think that he was born about 1800 BCE in a town called Ur in ancient Iraq, one of the most continuously inhabited cities on earth. Uh, this is going way back into what we all learned in high school was called the, the cradle of civilization there, that, that land the Greeks called Mesopotamia, which means the land between the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, modern day Iraq. And so it's kind of delicious, isn't it, that the Western religions, Judaism and Christianity particularly, are Iraqi religions. They originate from this monotheistic idea from the prophet Abraham. Now, Genesis tells us that God chose Abraham and, and asked him to leave his native land and go far away and settle in a far off place called Canaan. And the Canaanites were then in that land. Now watch what happens. God says to Abraham, the sojourner, the traveler, God says to Abraham, I assign this land to you as an everlasting holding to be yours and to be your descendants' land as an everlasting holding. The journeyer in a foreign land has just been granted an eternal deed to that property by the Lord. And so the book of Genesis tells us that the land of Canaan, today what we would call is, is Israel, is, a, is the homeland, is the promised land land to Abraham and his descendants. And so it becomes important, doesn't it, to figure out who the descendants of Abraham are? Maybe we'll get to that later. So the other piece of that story is that God continues, continually promises to Abraham, you will be the father of a great nation and you will have many descendants. But he and his wife Sarah are in their 90s and they still don't have any children. And so uh, that is a problem that we'll see if we can stitch that together later. But there's an interesting story about Sodom that I want to get to, too. And that is this idea that there's this evil city called Sodom, after which we have a whole category of sexual behavior today named, namely sodomy. I'll let you look that up. And Sodom was, according to Genesis, a really horrible, despicable place where all kinds of cruel and inhumane things are happening. And God decides, that's it, I'm going to blow the place up. I'm going to kill everybody in Sodom. Now, you may be familiar with the, uh, the flood story earlier in Genesis uh, when God killed everybody on earth except Noah and his descendants because there was such wickedness in the human family. It's one of those great archetypal flood stories that you see in all cultures of the world. The biblical one was pretty fierce, though. And after the biblical flood, where Noah built an ark and all that, God says, I'll never do that again. But apparently, according to this story, in Abraham's time, a little later, God is still willing to blow up a town. And Sodom was slated for destruction. And then there's a curious moment. God kind of says to himself, shall I? Shall I tell Abraham what I am about to do? It's almost as if God is like, concerned with this man, Abraham, thinks of his decision. 
I'm struck by that. That shows you how close God and Abraham are. Why would the almighty sovereign Lord and master of the universe be concerned with what this little dude running around down here on the ground thinks about his righteous decision? But he does. There's a, that's a window, isn't it, into the relationship between Abraham and God, and maybe by extension between all of us and God, that God looks for a collaboration of some kind. So God says, shall I tell, shall I tell Abraham what I'm about to do, namely blow up Sodom? And apparently he decides to tell him. So he tells Abraham his plans, and Abraham goes to work. Watch what Abraham does. Abraham says, well, okay, but wait a minute, God, what if you, what if you find um, innocent people. What if you find 40 innocent people in Sodom? Wouldn't it be wrong to punish the innocent for things that they did not do? Shall not the earth, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? Abraham asks. <laughs> He's pushing back on God. He says, hold on, God. You're a just God. It is unjust to punish innocent people for the crimes they did not commit. Therefore, maybe don't blow up this city if you find innocent people in it. And God's like, hmm, all right, all right. You're right, Abraham. If I find some innocent people there, I won't blow up the city. And then Abraham's not done. He says, well, what if you find just 30? What if you find just 20? What if you find just 10 innocent people? God says, all right, all right, all right. I won't blow it up for the sake of the 10 innocent. Look at what just happened there. Look at what Abraham just did. And look at what he just modeled for us. Namely, God, uh, Abraham was willing to speak truth to power. Is that wonderful phrase? The idea that maybe justice is something that we and God have to work out together. Now, it's remarkable that Abraham changed God's mind. He's like the first lawyer. And, and his clients in this pro bono case are the um, hypothetical innocent of Sodom. Abraham isn't arguing for his own interests. He's not arguing for his friends. He's, he's arguing for a philosophical principle, namely justice, rightness, what is moral. And he's using the tools of language and persuasion. He is using philosophical argument and logic to change God's mind and together collaboratively, collaboratively with him construct justice. It's a remarkable moment. By the way, Apparently, God couldn't find any innocent people in Sodom, so he did blow it up. But that's almost besides the point. The exchange they had was kind of remarkable. Now, as I mentioned before, Abraham and his wife Sarah are unsuccessful parents at this point. They have no children. So it's Sarah's idea that, that Abraham uh, conceive a child with their slave girl, Hagar. And so they have a child named, Ish, named Ishmael. And Sarah finds that kind of tense and awkward and eventually sends both of them away. And then they conceive their own son, Isaac. So now Abraham has two sons, Ish, Ishmael through the slave girl, Hagar, and Isaac through his own wife, Sarah. So these two sons will become patriarchs of their own. Uh, the Quran tells us that Abraham escorted Hagar and Ishmael to Mecca, Saudi Arabia, where they built the Kaaba. And therefore, Islam traces its lineage back to the patriarch Abraham through Ish Ishmael. And Judaism, and of course later Christianity, trace their lineage back to Abraham through Isaac. And so Abraham literally, not metaphorically, literally is the patriarch of the three great Western religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And there's one last story I want to look at with you today, and that is the story of the sacrifice of Isaac. It's one of the most challenging stories in the book of Genesis. God normally doesn't go in for human sa sacrifice, but 
This time he does. He comes to Abraham and he says, yeah, I know you got, you got your own son now, Isaac, through your wife, Sarah. You know what? I need you to kill him for me. I need you to take him up on the altar on top of the mountain, tie him up and sacrifice him like you do animals for me. Look at what Abraham does. Does Abraham argue? Does he push back as he did before in the Sodom story? Does he question God's administration of justice? No, no, and no. Abraham, when asked by God to kill his son Isaac, Abraham says, okay. Complete submission, complete surrender. In fact, this moment has been taught by rabbis, Christian teachers, Muslim teachers for thousands of years as the model of faith, the model of submission. In fact, Muslim means one who submits, one who surrenders. There's a reason Abraham is such a key figure in the Quran. I think he's mentioned over 40 times in the Quran. Ib, Ib, uh, Ibrahim. He is the model of surrender in this story. And he goes about to do it, right? He, he takes his son Isaac. He says, hey, let's go up the mountain and do a sacrifice like we usually do. And, you know, uh, Kierkegaard wrote a book about this called uh, Fear and Trembling. And in Kierkegaard's analysis, uh, this is a remarkable moment because Abraham, in his religious compliance, suspends the ethical. That's Kierkegaard's phrase. In other words, Abraham breaks every rule. He breaks the rule of the covenant of marriage. He lies to his wife. He lies to his son. He lies to his, to his farmhands, his, la his laborers. He breaks all human rules in his compliance with God's rule. And this is, to some, an inspiring show of faith, and to others, kind of a troubling foreshadowing of the dangers of thoughtless compliance with immoral orders. But I know what you know. It ends well, right? So Abraham and Isaac go up to the mountain and Abraham is about to do the deed with his big knife and, and, and the angel Gabriel appears and says, wait, that was just a test. We just wanted to see if you, you know, were submissive enough to God and he was. And then the angel Gabriel says, untie your son and there's a ram tied up in that bush. Go get him and do the sacrifice. But I wonder if young Isaac ever wanted to go hiking with his father again after that particular incident. But nevertheless, look at the juxtaposition of these two stories. I, I'm, I'm really struck by this. And it's a potent, powerful paradox. In the Sodom, and, uh, in the Sodom story, Abraham models for us speaking truth to power and wrestling to co-create justice with God. That it is the moral, that, that it is the human obligation to, to create justice in the world through the application of philosophical principles, through argumentation, through logic, every tool in the box. You and I have to fight to make this world more just. And then in the sacrifice of Isaac story, we have once again that mystical a sort of paradoxical, mysterious moment where God asks Abraham to do something by all standards, horrific and impossible. And Abraham absolutely surrenders as if to say, whatever role you want us to play, God, in the administration of justice, I know that we are not your equals, that we are that we see, as Paul will later put it, we see but through a glass darkly, that I don't have all the answers. I don't see the whole picture as an omniscient being would. And therefore, along with my participatory activities in the, in the maintenance and sometimes construction of justice, I must also balance that with the consciousness of submission of surrender and that when we this is the great paradox of so many spiritual traditions that when we surrender we are filled with strength and so at the core of this 
Western religious perspective, beginning with Judaism, I think Abraham is such an important seed that gets planted and out of which many branches will grow. Next time, we'll turn to another absolutely essential voice in the early formation of what will become Judaism. And that is, of course, the key figure of the second book of the Torah, the second book of the Bible called Exodus. And you know I'm talking about Moses. So I'll see you on the other side.